Welcome to South by Southwest 2021, everybody. This is the Future of Cannabis is Appalachian Designation Panel. Uh, we're all speaking to you from sunny California, from varied locations and varied Appalachians. Um, myself, I'm Joyce Sonali with Big Rock Partners. Uh, we have Tina Gordon from Moon Made Farms, Josh Keats from Henry's Original, and Aaron Kiefer from Sonoma Hills Farm. Uh, so we're going to kick this off in a moment. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to share um, a quick video to give everybody a sense of where we're all speaking to you from and uh, what the topics are. One moment. Appalachians are incredibly important. This is how we differentiate products and where they come from. Champagne is only from Champagne, France. Sparkling wine can be great, but it's not champagne. We have the same thing with cannabis. Right now we have strain specific cannabises on the menu and everybody's out there trying to chase a strain or chase a, a, you know, the hype behind it. But at the end of the day, how it's grown is just as important as the genetics. There's three parts to getting the final flavor of a, of a cannabis and it starts with genetics. And then you have life in the soil and how you grew it and then how it's cured. Appalachians are very important because the actual growth and the life of the plant happens in the Appalachian that it will be designated in. So you will be able to start to try to say, I like this cannabis from this area. I like this cannabis from this area. As we evolve, we will have Appalachians just like wines. Another reason why it's so important is because of education and you know, drawing the consumer back to the plant. We all love to go visit wineries and understand yeah how the sommelier and how the team, you know, sort of came to, to, to the bottle that we're drinking. That is going to be so exciting in cannabis where the cultivator is able to interact directly with their consumer and educate them not only about their specific genetics, but forward the plant in general. But with the ABA and Appalachians program, hopefully the smaller farmers, the medium farmers, those that are doing something culturally or farming practices that are super differentiated to their region will continue to have a voice as this industry evolves. Awesome guys. So to introduce the, the panelists a little bit more so, um, myself, um, I work with a group called Big Rock Partners. Uh, we have been investing in the cannabis space since uh, 2016. Um, we have investments uh, in Henry's Original, Sonoma Hills Farm, Canna Craft, uh, to name a few. Um, I myself used to be a craft cannabis cultivator, um, won an Emerald Cup in 2016, um, but segued into focusing on other great parties um, and their endeavors. Um, also on the panel, we have Tina Gordon from Moon Maid Farms. Tina hails from Southern Humboldt's Palo Verde Appalachian. She relocated up there in 2007, and prior to that, ripped it up as a musician, producer, event promoter down in the Bay Area. Uh, through a very serendipitous twist, uh, she found herself um, with this beautiful stretch of land that once belonged to a dear friend, and it has become her home. Um, so they've been developing cannabis uh, for, for many years. Uh, she navigated from the medical market into the regulated market. Um, she also thrives as an active cannabis farmer and advocate um, and works with so many great organizations. Um, she's also a, a board member for Sun and Earth and, and actively involved in various other collectives that, that many of us would be you know, familiar with. Josh Keats is the co-founder and co-CEO of Henry's Original. He hails from Mendocino's Long Valley Branscombe Leggett Appalachian um, and is responsible for ensuring the company's supply chain runs efficiently uh, from cultivation to processing, production logistics, and distribution. He ensures the company is in compliance with state and local regulations and manages the administration, finance, government and community relations for the company. 
um, through friendships, uh, he sort of landed himself uh, and moved up to the notor notorious Spyrock Road in northern Mendocino County. So he's been navigating many Appalachians over the years. Um, he started out also, uh, prior to coming into cannabis, he also uh, was in music. So both Tina and Josh, incidentally, had played South by Southwest in their former careers as musicians back in the day. And then finally, Aaron Kiefer is the Vice President of Cultivation and Production at Sonoma Hills Farm, a craft cannabis and culinary farm located in the Sonoma Valley, um, bringing premium craft cannabis to the farm to table lifestyle. Um, Sonoma Hills Farm strives to be a cultural and educational intersection of cannabis and traditional agriculture. Prior to joining Sonoma Hills Farm in February 2020, Aaron held a 10-year tenor um, as the culinary garter for the Thomas Keller Restaurant Group, supporting various Michelin star restaurants and chefs, including the French Laundry up in Napa, California. He also, however, has produced cannabis since he was a teenager. Um, so on this panel, you have some of the, the traditional cannabis growers that have now walked into the regulated market. Um, so with that, I'd love to kind of kick this off by asking everybody on the panel why this topic is so incredibly important to you personally. Um, Tina, let's start with you. Thanks, Joyce. Um, the reason why I think that um, Appalachians of Origin and particularly a terroir-based Appalachian of Origin program in California is so important because I think ultimately this will draw people's awareness back to where this plant is from. And this is an ancient plant that predates our relationship to it. And for the human relationship and symbiosis for with this plant to do it justice, I really think it means bringing it back to source and place and where it's from and how it's grown. And um, we are in the heart of the Emerald Triangle, really close to where the three counties meet Humboldt, Mendocino, and Trinity counties. And there's a very unique uh, landscape here and history that is the history of modern cannabis, you know, as we know it today. And before prohibition, this plant was grown in the ground, in full sun, and in the air. And one of the reasons why I think it thrives so incredibly here is for these reasons. And so really, as this plant is opening up and becoming accessible, not only in California, in the United States, and in, in soon every state in the United States and internationally, people are going to have more access to this plant than ever before. And so I think the time is now to bring the attention back to the natural forces that have helped shape this plant and the unique expressions that uh, each one of our Appalachians can offer. Excellent. Josh, what are your thoughts on this? I think there's a, a lot of layers to the importance of Appalachians. Uh, you know, there's the immediate difference in uh, farming practices that you'll see that will pr produce a different crop. You know, the, the inputs um, in farming are dictated by your environment. And when you change environment, you change input and you get a different product, even from the exact same genetics. So I think it'll allow the consumer to understand exactly what they're purchasing, what they're experiencing a little bit more. Um, most importantly, though, I think is the, the social aspect of it, uh, the community aspect of it. You know, people farm similarly in similar regions. And part of the experience of going to a region as a, an agritourist is to see how they farm, experience the, the farm, the facilities, the farmers. Um, that, that's, that's really something that drives the consumer desire for a particular uh, type of uh, cannabis uh, from a certain region. Uh, I think that there is a, a lot of growth um, and uh, a, a, a large um, increase in the value to the communities uh, in promoting the way uh, that the Appalachians differ. Absolutely. Aaron, why is it important to you? Well, 
cannabis was the first plant that I fell in love with, but I've grown thousands of varieties of plants after that, and mostly for very discerning palates. And I think that the palate um, discussion is really important when it comes to terroir. Um, you know, when you grow one type of tomato in a different soil, or even if you use city water versus well water, the flavor is going to be completely different. It's the same with cannabis. It really starts with genetics. And then you reach that potential of the genetics by growing it in live soil, hopefully under sun, um, and, and hopefully, hopefully uh, to fruition to a full term product. Um, you know, and it really matters where you grow it. If you grow that same variety at 3,000 feet, usually the oils are a little higher because it had a little more uh, um, uh, radiation from the sun. You grow it down at sea level, it might have a little more terpenes because it wasn't as hot. Um, you know, there's, there's a big difference in where you grow it and how the end product is. And the three legs of, uh, of flavor is, of course, the genetics and then life in the soil and where you grew it. And then, of course, you have to cure it correctly to carry that through. But you can move one valley over from Sonoma to Napa and then from Napa to the uh, Sacramento Valley and have the same exact cut off the same mother plant, which would be the same genetics and have three different um, products completely. So it's really important to uh, kind of nail down where it was grown. And that way I think consumers can decide where they want to purchase a particular uh, variety or particular uh, genetics. Cause they can say, oh, I like, you know, Spyrock from Spyrock or I like uh, RBGOG from Sonoma. Absolutely. So a little bit of background about kind of how we arrived here in California. Um, California in September of 2020, um, Governor Newsom passed uh, SB 67, um, which declared or recognized Appalachians of origin. They still haven't, you know, formally moved forward with authorizing a specific Appalachian. I believe that will happen sometime in 2022. Um, and to date, um, California is actually the only state that has embra embraced this as part of our regulatory body. Um, other states hopefully will come behind us, but to date we are the only ones to do it, um, which does you know, give testament to the California Department of Food and Agriculture's you know, understanding that cannabis is so imperative to our farming communities. Um, you know, this is really a, a nod to craft farmers. Um, I definitely want to give the Origins Council uh, large props here and their founder, Janine Coleman, who has been, you know, fighting this fight for a long time. You know, many of us are involved with a lot of the local trade organizations in varied counties. Um, the Origins Council has really brought those groups together um, to sort of lobby and petition to the state to make this part of the, the cannabis program out here. Um, so, you know, to, to everybody, to echo everybody's points, um, you know, really the goal is to give the consumers kind of a conscious ability uh, to, to shop and to understand where their cannabis is coming from. You know, I think a lot of us have historically purchased cannabis from indoor, mixed light, otherwise facilities, and the consumer to date really hasn't had that recognition of, you know, where their cannabis is coming from. So this is a hugely important step to, you know, giving the, the consumer that information, but also, you know, giving the, the farmers the ability to connect with those consumers and, you know, sort of play forward uh, the values that that, that farmer's bringing to light. Um, so relative to how cannabis or how Appalachians are gonna be defined moving forward and bringing us to sort of a sense of place, um, I wanted to kind of, you know, speak to, to each one of you in terms of where you're speaking from and, you know, what about your specific terroir would you see will be defined in your Appalachian? Um, Josh, why don't we start with you? Well, uh, we cultivate in multiple Appalachians in Mendocino County, um, the, from the valley to, to the top of the hills. Uh, one of our farms is uh, about 3,500 feet on Spire Rock. Another one is uh, down around 1,200 feet uh, in the Long Valley, um, the 101 Ranch. And uh, the, there is such a difference in the way we have to farm in each of these sites. Um, you know, the, the, our farm on Spire Rock uh, at 3,500 feet, surprisingly, it stays warmer later. Uh, we don't need to worry about uh, early frosts, but the valley will get hit. You can have a, 
you can be 50 degrees up on Spy Rock at four in the morning and you can be 20 degrees down in, in, the, in the valley next to 10 Mile Creek there. Um, it, it requires a, you know, a dynamic um, in the inputs we use, the way, that we, uh, the way that we farm. I know Aaron and I uh, have chatted about this some. We have slightly different uh, feelings uh, exactly what defines um, the terroir, but uh, you know, whether, you, whether you use plastic or other frost protection, um, uh, whether you, um, uh, wh where, where your water comes from, uh, things like that. Um, I think the most important part with the consumer uh, it, it is going to be to, to figure out what, what characteristics they like from each, um, from each region. Yeah. And Tina, you're, you're in a very critical area. I mean, your area, there's just been so many historic farmers up there. I mean, when, when we read things about where farming comes from and, and Southern Humboldt, you know, it's, it's right up the road that you live on. Can, can you speak to your project and then other surrounding projects around you and, and the Appalachian that you're, it's beautiful too. I mean, goodness. This area has a long and varied legacy and history and heritage. Um, we are, where we are is 2,100 feet in elevation, 33 miles from the Pacific Ocean. And it is removed from really any populated area. And so there's a kind of privacy here. There's a peace here and a quiet. And the homesteaders chose to be here because it is a removed location and because it was available. And so when the loggers and the ranchers, really the logging industry um, fell out, there was a lot of land for sale and the homesteaders made their way north from the Bay Area largely. They had come to the Bay Area from all points in the country. And so in the 70s and 80s, uh, these hills became populated with folks who wanted to live sustainably and live their own, you know, an independent life. And um, it's those, like it's the homesteader ethos that I really relate to and appreciate and one of the reasons I love this area. And so um, cultivating cannabis was really about cultivating cannabis along with cultivating food and raising animals, uh, raising your family independently, homeschooling, building schools, building uh, volunteer fire departments and being integrated into a community that was very self-sustaining. And so today, I think in regard to acknowledging that, it's also in the practices of both utilizing some new ways and acknowledging the ways of the original homesteaders. So, you know, using rain caught water and planting in the ground and inoculating all of the soil with indigenous microorganisms and with forest mycelium um, and really, uh, honoring the fact that we are in this gorgeous oak grove and the oak gives us so much that the oak is going to be part of everything we do from building soil to compost to mulching and um, it is to ash it's probably our most essential input so it really is this woven um, story that involves the people who came here and gave us the opportunity to be here and really led the path and honoring the ways in which they grew this plant. Absolutely. Can I respond actually a little bit, you know, Tina, you're, you're talking about something that I think is really important to, to define and, and that's the, the, the Appalachian, the, the terroir is, is dictated as much by the community, by the, the farmers, by the practices, uh, you know, uh, as it is by the, the sun or the soil or the difference in, in the water there. The community um, and the, the location, the, the social part of the location has so much to do with it. Um, it's, the, it's the branding, it's the, 
it's the marketing piece of it almost. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to have to define that moving forward. And the way that we name these Appalachians is, you know, still to be defined. Aaron, relative to, to where you are in Sonoma, um, I understand it, it was the most recent uh, wine AVA to, to sort of be awarded in the nation. So um, how do you see that playing forward? And wh how, what is the relevance and importance to that uh, from the cannabis side? So it is the most recent wine AVA. It's called the Petaluma Gap. And the reason for that is there's a gap in the mountains all the way to the ocean, which is about nine miles away, which creates this constant flow of uh, air. You know, California breathes when the, when the inside of California gets hot, it draws in the marine air, air, air and then it kind of goes out um, at night once it cools down. So it's a constant flow of air movement out here. We're about 320 feet of elevation and uh, maybe about an hour from San Francisco, but this is West County. It truly is country. Um, but I think that, I think what I want to talk about here on this piece of land is What's interesting is before cannabis was grown where it could be grown. It was grown where it could be hidden. It was grown um, under redwoods. It was grown on the mountains in, in re remote desolate regions where it wasn't really traditional farmland. Farmland has been um, settled and, and used for you know, 100, 150 years here in the US. And this is what's interesting about this piece of land. This piece of land was one of the first areas that was farmed in, this, in Sonoma County. And why would they pick this piece of land over every other piece of land when it was all available to them? It's because it was great farmland. And we're starting to see um, the ability to grow cannabis on great farmland for the first time, where we don't have to hide. We can have it out in the middle of a, of a field that was used in the past for barley, corn, um, and then it moved into chicken production and then rotational grazing uh, for, for cattle. But you can grow pretty much anything out here. We're, we're very temperate. Uh, we don't get very hot and we don't get very cold. I have yet to see a frost out here, which just over the valley in Napa Valley where I live, it's frosting um, quite a bit during the winter. Here it's, it's uh, very, very temperate. And that doesn't um, allow for the plant to kind of cook off the terpenes. Um, you know, if it gets too hot, everybody who's Everybody who's uh, grown knows if it gets really hot, that kind of cooks the flavor off at the end. Um, same as if you had a problem with your indoor room and it got too hot, it kind of uh, burns off some of the flavor. So we never really get that hot uh, because of the marine layer. Um, it's great farmland. And then we can kind of, uh, the only issue we have out here is there is a little bit of too much moisture from the marine layer. So, you know, as in any other ag product, um, there will be a little bit of ag loss to it. We might have a little bit of uh, um, you know, issues because of the increased humidity, but at the end of the day, the product that makes it through is really, really beautiful. Great. In terms of um, you know, farming techniques um, that are utilized, um, cannabis is probably one of the more varied agricultural, uh, agriculturally farmed uh, plants in that, you know, so many people use different recipes and, 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 and different methods. Um, so, and I think there's a little bit of a debate about, you know, what an Appalachian should, what should go into that definition? You know, we've got indoor mixed light um, and then outdoor. Um, what does everybody think about, you know, what the, the definitions behind um, how California should sort of solidify this forward? Um, Josh, I'm going to ask you this one first. Well, I, I certainly uh, think that uh, indoor deserves its own appellation, probably regardless of where it's grown. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that that would be my one place where I would disqualify uh, a cultivation from from using that. But I, I'm open. You know, I think when when I started growing cannabis, uh, well, it was in my closet first. But uh, you know, out, outdoor it was like what Aaron was talking about. You know, the uh, the land that I was able to grow on was land where I could hide it that had natural water. Um, and, and we would go out and we'd, we'd dig holes and we'd mix in uh, amendments that we carried on our back up the hill. And, um, and that produced some pretty good cannabis. You know, at this point, we, uh, we tractor farm, we, uh, we rip, we spade, uh, plant a cover crop, uh, flail mow it, spade in compost and, uh, and plant. I, I, you know, people trucking in manufactured soil, putting it in the grow bag, you know, 
I, I could be convinced either way. Um, I think that it's, it's hard to say the line is right here. Uh, okay, you can truck in compost, but you can't truck in perlite. Um, you know, I'm, I'm open to it. I think for me, so much of an Appalachian is the cultural part of it. When you, I'll take an analogy from the wine industry, when you're selling grapes, you have a grape buyer, a wholesale grape buyer come out to your vineyard and they're taking it all in. These vineyard, vineyards are pruned and maintained the way they're, they are as, as a marketing tool to create this, this appellation, this distinction. Uh, you know, the vineyard in Mendocino looks like this, a vineyard in Napa looks like this. And uh, I think the cultural part of the appellation is so, so important. I would say it actually outweighs a, a lot of the the, 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 the sun and the air and the water uh, and the soil, none of those things aren't important, but um, the cultural part is the most important to me. So yeah, I would say indoors disqualified. And other than that, I think that it's, uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation that, you know, the hear what other people have to think about where that line is. Yeah. Tina, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that, um, I, I tend toward a bias that is about biodiversity and that is about uh, the living things here and all living things and all the living things that predate us. And so I think that the terroir is made up of the, uh, of the earth and the sun, the light, the night light, the night sky, the airflow the microorganisms, the trees that are here, the forest, everything that lives in the forest. And all of that has been here for thousands of years. And we have been here for a fraction of the time that everything else has. And so our engagement and interaction with the land, the landscape, the environment, it's like, what are we, what is our, what defines our relationship? And so what are we harnessing from the land what are we giving back to the land? And so the regenerative aspect here, I think is so important to call out because with farming at large, unless we start really uh, becoming examples and living examples of how to change what industrial agriculture looks like, I think that the planet has been suffering and will continue to suffer because of these practices. And so to align with um, the, the planet, truly, um, in regard to the planet as being the defining force as opposed to imposing our will, I think is the most essential thing we could do right now. And um, with cannabis, it is a plant that can uh, teach people how to grow plants and how to live in a symbiotic relationship with plants and with the, with the earth. And so um, as opposed to traditional or modern farming techniques, I really like a no-till approach that is about um, biodiversity and interplanting and cover cropping and um, using as few uh, machines as possible. So we use largely, as a matter of fact, almost all hand tools. And um, it's, I think that, and that's what just resonates most for me. And so as opposed to taking the lead and imposing my will and my control, I am um, in, I've, I've got really, a, my philosophy is more about being in service to the plants and to the land. Awesome. So Aaron, you alluded that, you know, it's traditional farming land that, that you guys are cultivating on. Um, traditional farmland doesn't always mean native soil, you know, uh, other industries and other crops, uh, you know, folks are putting um, supplements um, in those. So how have you found um, from a terroir perspective, you know, the, the soil composition um, in, in Sonoma in terms of how that's gonna play into, you know, the, the Appalachian movement? So what we're growing on here is called Steinbeck loam. It's a really beautiful uh, uh, high silica loam. Um, it, it grows pretty much anything pretty well. Uh, we're, we're really lucky to be working with the soil as the base. Of course, amendments are added 
and we try to stick with, uh, or we do stick with all organic amendments, worm castings and cow manure and compost and, and you know, oyster shell flour, things like that. But for me, Appalachians 100% is, you know, the place, the air, the sun and, and everything about the environment. Um, you know, when you look at the French designation of Appalachians, which I think really truly are the people who um, started the conversation, you know, they will say that nothing comes between the, the, the plant and the soil and the, and the sky, you know, so your, 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 your singular definition is you grow outside with no other controls. You know, with cannabis, a lot of people have been growing inside hoop houses or, or even indoors if you want to go down, down that road. And that really does start to change the environment to the point where it's not really um, truly the, the appellation. It doesn't really have the true expression of appellation. So if you want to talk about true appellation, I would say that there's nothing in between the, the, the sky and the plant and then nothing in between the soil and the plant you're planting in the native soil. Um, my friend Richard Mendelson, who wrote the book on appellations for wine though, um, he's actually uh, part of the Appalachian Borders for, for California State, and he's, he's writing a book about it. He, he did allude to uh, Josh's um, point where Appalachians for, ca for cannabis are a lot different than Appalachians for wine. Appalachians for wine it really is about the soil and the weather and, and, and where you are in the, in the state. But Appalachians for cannabis, he said, are somewhat, um, you know, mythological. They're, they're what has been in the past. It's, it's, groups of people and stories that were told in, in areas that were kind of grouped together in communities. So I think that cannabis does kind of hold um, both, both sides when it comes to Appalachians. But for my definition, I know that if you grow, you know, the same exact plant under, under a, a hoop house or the same exact plant with uh, city water, which has been treated versus well water, it's going to have a different flavor. So for me, Appalachian is, is, is pure, just sun, earth, and, and the plant itself. And from a timing perspective, um, you know, Tina, I'd love your thoughts on this. In terms of where we are um, in the state of California, we passed Prop 215 in 1996, which was the first state to do a vibrant medical program. And we had almost 20 years of, you know, I would say, you know, innovation from, from craft uh, farmers and, and, and manufacturers um, until now, uh, 2016, we passed Prop 64, which went legal in 2018. And um, it seems like there's been a little bit of, um, you know, pressure down um, on some of the craft growers. So this introduction, hopefully this will come live in 2022. What does that mean from a timing perspective for craft cannabis growers? Well, I think that a lot of that depends upon uh, consumer preference. And that's one of the reasons why I think Appalachians of Origin are so important. It's so important because it's really connecting consumers to source and helping them define their preferences. And so um, I think that what's going to happen is we're going to see this become just more, more broad and accepted across the states. And as that happens, California will demonstrate itself as being unique. And so I think that craft cannabis is um, just starting to make a, uh, an impact and starting to enter the, the consumer consciousness. And it's, it's like a, um, and I think that there's the floodgates have opened, do you know? It's like the critical, we've tipped over that critical mass point. And I think that we're gonna see things move really quickly. And we're also going to see definitions around what is consistent and expected and what is unique and sought after. So Josh, to speak from the now to the you know, future, you know, what, what, what do you see this evolving in terms of, you know, supply chain, brand and product recognition? You guys are, you know, Mendocino born. So how do you see Mendocino exporting, you know, to, to consumers all over the country? I'm so excited about it. I mean, as a farmer, this is a, the Appalachian is the way that we can tell our story. I, uh, 
you know, where Tino's farm is, where my farm on Spy Rock is, this is where American cannabis was born, unequivocally. There's nobody in Missouri or Kansas or uh, New York City can tell the story that we can tell. And while we may see um, mass-produced cannabis coming out of other regions, the Appalachians, the story that we have as cultivators, as legacy cultivators here is going to define California and the micro regions and is really going to allow the small farmer to survive. Um, what the small farmer looks like, it probably isn't going to look the same, but um, the, the Appalachian, the designation is so important. Awesome. And, and so you, you guys are all cultivators. Um, is the expectation that, you know, this application would only apply specifically to the flower or are there other implications, you know, for edibles and for other products that people are interested in? Um, Aaron, I, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I believe that the source material always matters. And, and when you start with quality, you can end up with a quality product all the way down the line, whether it's even a gummy um, that has gone to uh, an extract or, you know, ex, uh, an extract like a hash or a press uh, definitely matters. It, it's all about the source product. You can't turn straw into gold. You can turn gold into straw, but um, if you start out with great source product, it will carry through all the way through all of your products. Awesome. And so in terms of, you know, uh, how that's processed, um, to, to speak to the full spectrum nature of, you know, what, what is originating in the flower and then forwarding into the end product. Um, do you think that, you know, California in terms of how it's presenting itself, both in terms of flower, but in terms of those other products will continue to be able to compete with, you know, it's, it's probably going to be Missouri, you know, they're probably going to make a decent gummy, uh, but maybe they're probably not going to produce great flour. Um, how, do, how do you feel that that, you know, sort of compares to what other states are going to be able to do all along the supply chain? I truly believe that um, this is an ingestible product. And what we're eating is how it was grown. What we're eating is the life of the plant. And what we're putting into our body is that. So I think that, um, you know, if we, if we pay attention to how we grow it, and we, we truly are stewards of the land and we grow something that we ourselves want to put into our bodies, I think that will carry through. And California will produce 70%, 80% of all the cannabis for the country, just like we produce all the vegetables and fruits for the country. We have the environment. It costs less to grow here because we have a more temperate climate, a Mediterranean climate. And uh, yeah, you have Missouri, New York, Michigan. Everybody can grow right now because the money is so uh, prolific in this industry. But as margins start to squeeze, you're going to look for a lower cost area to grow. And the land here is uh, costly, but the weather kind of evens out the cost of growing. And we have the talent. I mean, look at all the people who have dedicated decades of their life to this plant. I think that that's something that you can't really uh, export to a different um, state overnight. Yeah. So speaking of export, you know, unfortunately right now we don't have export, although uh, the traditional market, you know, you can kind of find that in many states right now. And most of it comes from uh, these spots in California. Um, but let's talk about tourism. So, you know, uh, cannabis tourism isn't technically a thing yet. It's not regulated. But, you know, how do you see that evolving in terms of consumers? You know, obviously, Tina, you're, you're quite a ways away from, you know, a major through way. Um, but I would imagine there would be a lot of folks that would be really excited to come up on that mountain. Uh, are you excited to have them? And, and what do you think tourism is going to look like? I think tourism is going to be really exciting uh, to be able to close the loop and to actually bring people physically here to the farm one day. Um, I think is it's one of the it's one of the goals. I mean, it really does bring a person then back to source and it it. Uh, it validates their intuition. You know, when somebody cracks open a jar of flour and they smell it yeah. and they're like, this is the flour for me. And then they realize where that flour is from. They're like, I want to visit this place. And they go to the place and the place resonates with them. I think that's a really special experience to have. And that connectivity is something that 
we lacked so much and historically has lacked in cannabis in, in recent history, in modern history due to prohibition. And so not only could you not know where the source of your cannabis was, it was really dangerous for you to know where the source of your cannabis was for everyone involved up and down the supply chain, you know? And even during medical and even now walking into a dispensary, there's so little information. So I'm looking forward to a day when there's research, there's education, there's access to more connectivity, physical connectivity, and a more intimate experience. You know, the, the way that we cultivate this plant is, a, is extremely intimate. It's all about sensory perception. And for someone to come here and to stand on the land and experience that, the way that we experience that, the way that the plants experience that, I think it's gonna be a magical experience. Absolutely. You know, so, so Josh, relevant to, to tourism, uh, because it's not allowed right now, um, you know, how, how do you see that evolving from a regulatory perspective? And if you had the opportunity to tell a regulator, you know, how this should work from a tourism perspective, like, what would you change about uh, the current letter of the law? Well, you know, we're, we're working on that with Mendocino County now. We've, um, I'm the, the president of the Cannabis Business Association of Mendocino County, and uh, it's, a, it's a lobbying base to, um, hopefully restructure some of the regulation to benefit the industry. Um, we've put forward working with some of our supervisors, uh, what we think will solve for this in the immediate, which is um, an ability for farms to have on-site consumption uh, through you know, a dispensary permit. Um, this could, you know, it, not that it would be without cost, but I think it's a step in the right direction of allowing uh, a farm should they want to invest in the, you know, obviously there's state requirements for the facilities that they could bring people on, uh, actually have a tasting room kind of scenario. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say the, I have always sold weed uh, off the farm as a, uh, ex through, through the experience of bringing people up there, you know, always uh, when buyers would come back in the medical days, it was, uh, you know, you take them on a tour, you, you, you get on the quad and you, uh, you drive them around to the, the gardens and they, they, they take it all in and they see how you operate to see the, the houses you've built there. They see the way that you cure and you dry, you know, they walk into the dry shed and, and um, being able to bring that down to the end consumer is really exciting. Uh, it, it's going to, it's going to, allow for the connection with the with the plant um, that definitely has been lacking you know for me the uh, the greatest benefit of cannabis is the the use the use of cannabis is the ability to uh, have a, a shift in your perception being able to get outside uh, the way that we interact with the world uh, I guess you'd call it in a sober um, sense and and, um, and look at things a little bit differently. And, and taking that onto the farm uh, extends that even, even greater. I think it really increases the value of the experience. Yeah. So Aaron, in terms of visitors um, to, to your farm and, and otherwise, I know you guys have um, sort of a contiguous farm where there's all sorts of, um, most of you have other produce on your farms outside of cannabis, but um, I think Sonoma Hills Farm has a particularly large uh, vegetable garden. Uh, one thing that, you know, I always echo is that uh, I think probably like 50% of the people that I work with in the cannabis industry have literally never gone to an outdoor farm. <laughs> They've just seen cannabis in indoor environments, which is just so weird. And probably a fair majority of the regulators in Sacramento <laughs> have never been to an outdoor farm. So, you know, what is it like to bring somebody, you know, to walk amongst the corn and then into the cannabis or maybe they can't go into the cannabis i'm not sure but well we're here to normalize the plant because at the end of the day that's what this is is a plant and when you see a hemp plant that looks just like a cannabis plant growing next to a tomato plant and next to a basil plant you look around and you say oh it's just a plant and it's not dangerous it's not something that's ever killed anybody um no matter what you've seen on tv but I think that our kind of like up in, in Josh, I mean, you're in a beautiful area. You can, you know, go look for Bigfoot and you can visit your farm. Um, 
you know, Tina, your place, all I can think of is peace. And I've been lucky enough to go to both of your farms. Um, when I'm up there on the hill, all I can think of is peace and quiet. And, and truly, um, I would love to do yoga up there. Um, our farm and what is unique about our farm um, and tourism is we're an hour from San Francisco. You know, the, the, the Humboldt and uh, Mendocino areas are absolutely beautiful and they will have their own uh, force when it comes to tourism. But we are a day drive away from um, five to six million people. And that's really our leg up on, on all of the tourism. We're absolutely going to be able to invite people um, to come out here and they can come out here. They can have a, a wonderful experience here. They can go taste some wine and have a, a dinner at a restaurant after that and then stay at a beautiful hotel. And I think that the infrastructure surrounding tourism in the wine country, which is where we're growing, is really our, our kind of strong point when it comes to tourism. Um, I'd also like to, to say that when it comes to tourism and uh, the small craft cannabis farm, um, direct sales and, and tasting rooms is what saved small wineries. And it's what's going to save craft cannabis too. As the, as the uh, industry, uh, the conglomerates pick up more and more and uh, you know, the profit starts getting squeezed out and the profit margins getting, getting smaller. Um, how can you make money as a small grower when you don't have the firepower of the big guys? You're going to have to go direct sales. You're going to have to um, you know, invite people to your farm. And that way they can understand the practices that you're doing are different than the practices of the large um, you know, multi-state operators. And they can choose to uh, buy your product over something else. There's really great uh, wineries that make wonderful wine for $11 a bottle. Kendall Jackson's one of them that I can think of. You know, you can buy a great bottle of wine for $11 a bottle, but then you can buy a $2,000 a bottle Screaming Eagle. And what's the difference between that wine and the other wine? There's something, it's magic. And, and I can't really explain what it is, but there's a little magic when it comes to someone who pours their entire life and heart and soul into their craft. There's magic in restaurants, you know, there's, there's uh, the Cheesecake Factory and then there's the Three Star Michelins. There's something to it um, when you go above and beyond and create a, a really truly craft product. And I think that that's what will differentiate and save us. And the people who have that palate and understand the difference will truly um, appreciate it and they will spend a little money, more money on that cannabis, hopefully supporting the, the type of farmer that they want to see um, survive because if we're just chasing the bottom dollar, if we want the cheapest uh, cannabis out there, we're going to squash the way of life that has uh, kind of been created over the past 50 years here in California. And we're not going to have the cannabis that we want to put into our bodies. You know, we need to support the, the type of farms that we want to have survive. And that's really what tourism and uh, direct sales on the, on the farm will, will support. Awesome. So uh, everybody should be able to see, we've got um, kind of a map of uh, the Northern coast uh, wine growing regions where we've interwoven uh, the Appalachians, the proposed Appalachians or the presumed Appalachians, I should say, um, for each of the parties here. Um, I, I'm super excited for Appalachians to come live. I, you know, uh, it is a testament to, to California and, and I, I do want to echo that our our regulators took the right step in doing this, and we look forward to the day when this is um, available to all of us to apply to. Um, any final thoughts uh, from the panelists about the future of cannabis Appalachians? Yeah, I, you know, I, this is as critical as, as any part, as Aaron said, this is a, a collective decision about who survives in the future of the cannabis industry. And um, the designation of, uh, of where where we grow, the designation of that matters. Uh, that's everything. That that allows the the culture that has brought this um, to where it is now and allowed access to everyone. This is it's critical to keep it going. Tina, what are your thoughts? Final thoughts. I'm excited for this to start happening. It's going to be a lot of work between now and then. Our communities need to come together and um, define our appellations, create our petitions, define our appellations. And through this process, we're going to learn a lot and we're going to share a lot. Um, 
every farm that I've been to is an expression of a person's of a personality. So that all of our farms are going to be different. And what creates that, and once again, it's this magical thing, you can't really define it, but it's all of the micro and macro decisions that we make on a daily basis. And it's everything that's unique about that place. And the 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 purpose really when people when the consumers start to understand that indoor grown could essentially be grown anywhere and that the marker is absolutely there's incredible cultivators growing indoor and there's amazing science backing it up and it's like this incredible um laboratory experience however Appalachian of origin, I think, is really going to bring people back to the fact that we are living, we're living creatures on a living planet. And to have veneration for that, I think, is the highest call. Aaron, end us. I mean, I'd like to say that uh, what Tina said, you know, every farm is an expression of the farmer. Um, there's so many decisions that are made every day. Uh, because there's so many variables outdoors, you cannot farm from a spreadsheet. You you can't uh, you know because that cuts off all the peaks and valleys, and you get that what what we call in the industry mids. Um, you know, so you you just won't get that specialness. You won't get that magic. And so I, I truly do hope that we can uh, create a situation where, yes, uh, indoor cannabis is great. Um, you know, right now it's the top notch stuff on the shelf, and it costs the most. But I want to ask you, um, when you eat a beautiful sun-grown heirloom tomato in the peak of the season, does that ever get beat by a house tomato? No matter how many inputs you put into it, no matter how many uh, you know, things you do to it, it's not the same. And, and cannabis is a plant just like that plant. So I would really like you to kind of uh, break out of the mold of which is better because it looks prettier. You know, Maybe an organic apple has a couple little notches in it you know, where, where the bugs got to it, but at least, you know, it wasn't um, sprayed down with poison. And, and I would say the same thing with cannabis. Uh, we're ingesting this, we're putting it into our body. You know, we need to support the, the, the farming that's going to be right for us, for the environment. And uh, really the, the special part about it is it is a little better. Um, and once you kind of get outside of the uh, visuals of it, you'll realize it, it has a rounder high. It has a a better high and um, it's better for you. Amazing. Well, thank all of you so much for joining us on this panel today. Uh, you know, the future of California cannabis, um, you know, Appalachians will be a huge part of that. And uh, I think a lot of us have spent too much time in homes lately and we're ready to get back out there in the, into the world. So, um, you know, we look forward to inviting everybody out to California to enjoy this cannabis. So I want to thank Tina Gordon, uh, Moon Maid Farms, Josh Keats, Henry's Original, and Aaron Kiefer from Sonoma Hills Farm. Uh, I am Joyce Sonali from Big Rock Partners and Texas, we'll see you in 2022.